presentation you're going to have today, I have to tell you, is uh, very dear to my heart because we're going to be talking about a very common problem, maybe not as serious as we, some of the things we take care of. It doesn't cause cancer, and to my knowledge, it is yet to cause postpartum hemorrhage or maternal mortality, but it certainly does have its share of morbidity, and that is nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. I um, was fortunate a number of years ago, since I'm older than most of the people in here, to be able to treat nausea and vomiting in pregnancy, and I treated it very well for many, many years. And then, unfortunately, our legal profession got involved, and uh, we no longer had good medication. This April, the FDA approved a medication similar to that medication called Bindectin, and extremely similar, as you will hear today, and now we will have it available again in the U.S. I think this is important since we all know that 75 to 80 percent of pregnant women come in complaining one way or another. And I know that all those nice remedies like putting crackers by the bedside to eat day and night and uh, staying away from fatty foods and all of those work only until the phone rings. And then they say, it's not working, doctor, do something. Well, hopefully now we'll be able to have that. Today... Uh, if you look in your packet, you will find a article that Dr. Nebel and I wrote for ACOT Clinical Review, which will explain to you some of the details about why we don't have Bindectin available anymore. And if you want to get into much more detail than that, there is a website called Bindectin.com that you can go to, which will tell you a little bit about it. If you've read all of your practice bulletins from the college, number 52 will tell you that the college for a long time has recommended this type of medication combination. Unfortunately, when you use the individual products, what you're not getting is the sustained release, which is what the new product will do for you. Now, let me assure you, you're going to hear about it now and then, and you'll hear a lot about it. There was no absolutely no evidence that Bindectin ever caused a congenital anomaly. Now, our lawyer friends were able to prove that Bindectin was the worst drug to come out since radiation therapy. And radiation therapy, of course, could cause multiple gen genetic anomalies. But if Bindectin had been able to do that, it would have been probably one of the best mass killers that the companies had ever made. But the company, Merrill Dow, pulled it from the record in 1983. The reason was it was costing them more in legal fees to the attorneys, their attorneys, than it was to uh, keep producing the drug, and they just weren't making enough profit on it. So it was an a, uh, economic decision, not a medical decision. But some of the cases did do well. They got to the Supreme Court, and as you now know, there's the Supreme Court has made a ruling that in order to be an expert witness, you must at least have some experience with the case. And, of course, the college has an expert witness affirmation statement, which says the same thing. If you're going to be an expert witness, you should at least know what you're talking about. That was not the case in many of the Bindectin suits. Well, I'm not going to dwell on that. You can read about it. You can learn about it. I can tell you that uh, the Canadian experience, and you'll hear more about later, has been very extensive. The same drug has been available in Canada to our friends in Canada. I've been fortunate to go to many meetings in Canada, talk to our friends up there, fellow members, most of them you know are members of ACOG, and they've used this extensively with no problems. So we're going to be able to see that, and you will hear data about some of the multiple studies and all the things that have been done today. To, to make this a Category A FDA-approved drug. This is me. They put this so I would recognize myself. Uh, as the disclosure, I am on the advisory board following the study that I was the lead PI in the U.S. that the FDA looked at. I was asked to join the advisory board, and I did so, but I did that after our study was concluded. I want to start, and the main thing I'm going to cover this afternoon is the clinical trial. 
but let's look at the clinical trial experience with nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. Any clinician knows that there is a spectrum of nausea and vomiting that goes from very mild to women that are so deathly ill that they require hospital admission and at times uh, total parental nutrition. But it's common. Um, while we name it morning sickness, for some it lasts all day long into the evening, for some it's only in the afternoon. But 75 to 80 percent of pregnant women at some point will report nausea and vomiting during pregnancy. Again, severe nausea and vomiting of pregnancy, also known as hyperemesis gravidarum or HG, is seen in anywhere from 1 to 3 percent of pregnancies. And while that 1 to 3 percent is a relatively small number, it's not if you're one of those particular women. And it's not for you as the provider if that's your patient because it's miserable for both the provider as well as for the, the patient. Thankfully, it is self-limited and uh, there seems to be no long-term consequences on maternal health. Again, that is unless we end up having to put in a central line and we get sepsis and certainly the very ill can have complications. Again, as we've talked about, 50 to 90 percent of women will have nausea, 25 to 50 percent uh, will have vomiting, and recurrent nausea and vomiting in subsequent pregnancies is the exception, uh, I'm sorry, is the rule and not the exception. If they have anything in the first pregnancy, it foretells what they're likely to have in the, the subsequent pregnancy. Again, one of our basic rules of, of, of obstetrics. So 40% of the pregnancies from a host of sources, if you aggregate the data, have clinically significant nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. There is a significant impact. The impact goes from quality of life uh, all the way through the economic impact with severe nausea and vomiting in pregnancy estimated to cost approximately $130 million per year. And that's from hospital admissions alone. Um, again, from uh, two different studies, the women with nausea and vomiting of the pregnancy uh, half report that their work is affected. 40% uh, required time off from work. Relationships were uh, affected in half, and a significant number of these women stated that the nausea and vomiting actually caused them to feel and be depressed. So now let's, let's move to the study that I want to tell you about, and I want to recognize Dr. Uh, Corin for a second in the back. Dr. Corin designed this study and, and submitted it through Duchenne or with Duchenne to the FDA to say, what study do you need for us to bring this drug back uh, to the pregnant women in the U.S. and to the providers, whether uh, physician, midwife, nurse practitioner? So the study was... Uh, designed and approved in advance with what the endpoints would be by the FDA. The objective was to evaluate the effectiveness of doxalamine succinate 10 milligrams pyridoxine hydrochloride 10 milligrams in a delayed release preparation. Now that was and is known as diclectin in Canada. The name that it will have in the U.S. is diclegis. Uh, and to compare this with placebo for nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. This was a, a well-designed study. It's a randomized, double-blind, multi-center trial. And while I was fortunate enough to be the PI for the U.S. trial, I want to acknowledge that Steve Caritas um, at the University of Pittsburgh and Menachem Madodovnik um, at, uh, at the Washington, D.C. consortium were PI. So there's three major sites, Galveston, Texas, Pittsburgh, and the greater Washington, D.C. area where women were recruited. 131 were assigned to receive the active drug and 125 placebo, and this trial was limited to 14 days. Nausea and vomiting uh, of pregnancy symptoms were evaluated daily using the PUKE score. Dr. Corin, my hat is off to you. Who else would come up with a score and be able to name it PUKE other than my good friend from north of uh, uh, the border. 
this is that pregnancy unique quantification of emesis and global assessment of well-being. Um, it had been tried in Canada, it had been validated in Canada, and it really had uh, three primary questions. In the last 24 hours, for how long have you uh, felt nauseated or sick at your stomach? And again, ranging from not at all with a score of one to over six hours with a score of five. In the last 24 hours, have you vomited or thrown up? And we reverse the order, which is part of a good study design so that you can't simply check the same box over and over. And in the last 24 hours, how many times have you had retching or dry heaves without bringing up anything? That's the primary uh, endpoint that the FDA approved the drug. Now, we also looked at other endpoints that as a clinician would be important to me and I think as the pregnant woman would be important to them to include a global assessment of well-being. That included how many hours have you slept out of the last 24 hours. If this is not your normal sleeping hours or sleeping habits, uh, why not? On a scale of 0 to 10, how would you rate your well-being in the last week? Uh, referencing zero being the worst possible and 10 being the best you felt not during the pregnancy but prior to the pregnancy. Um, for the last several years I've not had many 10 days. I don't know about the rest of you. And can you tell what causes you to feel that way? This is the uh, algorithm for the study. It uh, is included in the slides and I'm not going to go over every single detail with you. Uh, but you can follow through it. Let me get to what the endpoint was. The endpoint was the change from baseline in the puke score. And you'll notice that for the diclectin group, uh, they uh, lowered that score by 4.8 compared to the placebo, which was a minus 3.9. Um, that statistically was a significant difference. I'm going to go over one other aspect in a moment the request for compassionate use, which I also think speaks highly to whether or not the women believed what they were receiving was effective or not. But again, this was the end point. FDA uh, assigned what this would need to be in advance, and the study achieved that. As the investigators, we were blinded to what they received. Same capsule, uh, we would know a lot number, but we had no idea what each particular woman was receiving. Um, I mentioned the primary endpoint and whether we look at it as the mean plus or minus the standard deviation, the median or the mean area under the curve, we achieved uh, high statistical significance. Secondary endpoint again was the global assessment of well-being and again significance was achieved at a, a P level of 0.005 for the mean we were close to significance in the time loss from employment. Now, close to significance statistically, but look at the number because there's statistics and then there is, okay, what effect did it have upon the woman? Time loss from employment, 0 0.92 plus or minus 3.86 days for the treatment group, 2.37 plus or minus 10.23 for the placebo group. Okay, if you're the woman, if you're the family, uh, I think this is an, an end point that if, if we had enrolled um, not that many more women in the, in, in the trial, it would have been very significant. But as an indicator of does this work or not, that they felt well enough to be able to go back to work and miss not nearly the amount of work was very significant. And now let's look at the compassionate use uh, again, highly significant. The women receiving the drug were much more likely to ask, can we continue the drug or can, can continue whatever they were taking because, again, they didn't know if they were getting the active ingredient or the placebo. Clearly, women receiving the placebo were 50% more likely to report use of alternate therapies and dietary modification. So that is, I think, another indicator of the effectiveness of the drug. Relative to serious adverse events, um, no statistically significant difference in any of these um, 
the one the FDA was most concerned about was somnolence. And if we look at those numbers, 14.5% in the diclectin or diclegious group versus 12% in the placebo, again, nowhere close to st statistical significance, again. I've never been pregnant and I never will be pregnant, but I've taken care of a lot of pregnant women and they are tired, especially if they're having significant nausea and vomiting in the pregnancy. So if we look at the effectiveness of delayed release doxalamine plus pyridoxin for NVP, our trial showed a significant improvement over placebo as measured in a change in puke baseline to day 15 the global assessment of well-being baseline to day 15, the day-to-day -day changes in puke and global assessment of well-being. It was significantly superior to placebo if judged by requests for compassionate use. Women receiving placebo reported greater than 50% more use of alternative therapies. And I think importantly for us as the prescriber, there was no increase in adverse effects compared with placebo, specifically somnolence or back pain. It's my real pleasure to introduce and bring up Dr. Corin. I want to say relative to the company, this study was done through the NIH OB Pharmacology Research Unit Network. Dr. Corin brought that to the network. He could have and the company could have gone through individual research firms and done the study at less of a cost they brought it to the NIH and through the NIH because I believe they uh, uh, wanted the highest quality study. So, Dr. Corin, thanks for allowing me to uh, be the PI for the U.S. study.